Okay, so I'm delighted to welcome to Composers in Conversation, episode four, the one and only Olivia Sparkhorn, who was my um, guest composer of the month for June 2022. And um, I first encountered Olivia, encountered Olivia's music in um, the context of a multitude of voices and her absolutely beautiful setting of Lux Eterna for harp and double voices. So to kick off, I wanted if you might perhaps tell um, us all about that, please. Oh, I'd love to. It's lovely to be chatting with you, Tammy. This is brilliant. Great to have you. Um, so that was a wonderful opportunity uh, to write for two choirs, actually, uh, which uh, the choir that I run um, at the school where I teach um, and a choir of um, volunteers from the local Salisbury community. Uh, and we invited them um, and I had my choir. Uh, and together um, I worked out what would be perfect for the combination of, of different voices. And the way I went about doing that was I was able to send a little survey to the women who volunteered to be in the voluntary choir to ask them what kind of music they enjoyed singing, what kind of music they hoped I would write. Uh, and it was great to have those responses. Um, and that really helped me to consider just what would be perfect for that, that sort of group. So that was a sort of unique experience, opportunity to, to, to write for that group as well. Um, and, and the whole, the whole um, uh, intention was that this would be for one of the International Women's Day services uh, that Louise Stewart and I and many others um, put together as, as part of a, a community project in Salisbury. Right, wonderful. Um, and tell me a bit more about the music itself. So I noticed listening to it that you make use of this kind of cluster like harmony to achieve a, a rather floaty and ethereal effect. And also um, you take the um, plain chant, Lux Eterna, and then you divide it up so you get these beautiful antiphonal effects. Yes, that's absolutely right. Yes, so um, the, 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 the women's choir, um, I, I conceived it um, in the place in which we were performing the piece. So uh, it's um, in St. Thomas's Church in Salisbury. Um, and the, the way that that church is set up, like, like many churches, is the, 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 the choir stalls are behind. Um, and then often when you have a visiting choir or a concert, they tend to stand in the crossing um, in, in that, 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 the, the, at the front of the nave. So um, the, the, the girls' choir, the choir I run, were there with the women's choir behind. And that enabled me to have that sort of antiphonal effect where I could have the the women chanting various lines from the Lux Eterna chant and the, the, the girls' choir um, singing lines that I had created from those cluster chords that you were that you were mentioning earlier. So we have that kind of shimmering effect. And of course, harp accompanied as well. So that the whole um, shimmering effect is on the harp itself, that sort of um, amazing effect that you can get on the harp. Uh, and uh, and also from the the, the use of the, um, the the distant voices and the more present voices. So, yes. Yeah, so it's like you're bringing heaven to earth because obviously everybody associates harps with angels and um, sitting on clouds. And so this idea of distant voices evokes that really beautifully. And there was one bit in the composition that I particularly liked, although it feels unfair to um, pick out any particular sections of such a beautiful composition, but there's a passage where you have an ostinato figure on the word sanctus. And yes. um, I noticed that you use ostinato quite a bit in your other compositions as well. So perhaps could you tell me a little bit about some of your influences and um, interests as a composer? Yes, it's true, I do. Um, I'm not quite sure where that's come from actually, but it, it is something that comes to me when I'm when I'm conceiving of a piece. Um, that idea of repetition, I think it's because I am primarily a, a choral composer and I think repetition works particularly well with voices and often with young voices because you can come up with a, um, a, a little motif that's easily memorable, easily taught, and then that repetition can create um, are just a, a sort of ethereal effect, which I quite like the idea of, particularly um, in you know, in a sort of sacred context. Um, in fact, it's interesting that I'm also really, as a teacher, um, a music teacher, I'm, I'm really interested in education theory. And, and there's one of these um, education theories about if you use repetition 
um, the listener, and of course, uh, by, by, by extension, the performer, um, has more sort of mental capacity to think and to do other things, because they're not constantly trying to remember the next phrase or learn the next phrase. And from a listening point of view, you kind of get used to the idea, and then you can start to hear some of the other things that are going on. So you might notice the harmony more, or you might notice the sort of dynamic contrast. It's, it's that sort of thing, you know, so you're not overwhelming the listener, and by extension, not overwhelming the performer, particularly with young voices. Yeah, I mean, the thing about repetition as well is that, um, I mean, one of my interests is in uh, minimalist music. Mm. And I like a way that it forces a change of the listener's perspective and perception. So when you repeat things, you begin to notice patterns and melodies can almost arise as a kind of psychoacoustic effect. And also, I think um, the use of repetition actually shows your skill and imagination as a composer, because it's one thing to have many, many different ideas and a kind of rhapsodic structure that doesn't really cohere. But if you are able to extract the maximum variety of possibilities from a small number of ideas, then the whole piece binds together well, um, but you also, as I say, get variety and different perspectives on what you hear. And um, so for me, the, um, Minimalists of the 60s and 70s are quite interesting, but that also brings us to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is the composition Donna Nobis Parchem, because this uses, now I'm absolutely kicking myself because you beat me to it, because you used the melody Loma May, which of course um, dates from um, the Franco-Flemish tradition in the late 15th and early 16th centuries, and um, of course, in Franco-Flemish music, ostinato and repetition are used a lot. And um, listening to your composition, Donna Nobis Parchem, um, I felt that I could detect some sort of strains of um, Okegan, perhaps with the long flowing lines. So could you tell me more? Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, it's Robert Carver, um, who is the... Um... Oh, up from where you, well, you up from your your uh, region of the of the country, um, um, up near Scotland, uh, uh, composer again from from the era that you were talking about, who I think is the only composer in um, in the UK uh, during that era to have used that particular long army um, um, uh, melody in his masses. Really. In yeah, um, so obviously you're right. No, on the continent, I think for forty composers at least were using that. Yes. Um, but uh, as as yeah, so it's it's um, and in fact the the reason that piece came about at all was that um, the choir Capella Nova held a competition, uh, and mm -hmm. I wanted was was seeking um companion pieces potentially, uh, well certainly pieces that would work in a concert alongside the Robert Robert Carver, um, mass, and I thought to myself, well goodness me. What what, a, what an amazing opportunity to combine uh, the in, the the intention of um, that tune, which is um, the armed man should be feared, mm -hmm. which is the translation of, of the, the French song, um, alongside the sentiment Donna Nova's Parchem give us peace, you know, and, and n never more has that been more you know kind of relevant now than well, it's always relevant, isn't it? But <laughs> you know, it just. It's such. I think it's just such a a great sentiment to kind of combine. And and, and if if you um as a listener know the tune, recognize the tune, then you know the 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 the, the, the meaning of the tune. And even if you don't, it just it's a really effective um, melody that well composers have used. And I yeah was really pleased to be able to use in that piece. So it combines actual quotations from Robert Carver's um actual oh, Don Lewis yeah um um with as you can you very clearly the um the lom arm um melody um which i then kind of made into a round uh and yeah it's that my my thinking behind that was to sort of draw the two eras together to sort of bring that renaissance sound um and make it sound like it should be in the here and now without anyone quite realizing why does that sort of make sense it does indeed i mean as as in my own compositions, I try to revisit techniques from the Renaissance and then find ways to use them afresh, giving, um, using um, different approaches to dissonance, harmonic handling, rhythm, and so on. Um, exactly. But this, yes. yes. So yeah. um, using parallel harmony, but in perhaps a more contemporary way, right? Yes, like exactly. someone, someone like Eric Whitaker might do. So it's it's parallel yeah. harmony um, and it's false relations, but they are in a, a sort of contemporary 
it's sort of sound world. Yes, I mean, I think that it's, um, I think it's possible if you rethink, I mean, what I do is I go back to the, to the very fundamental rules of music and then I am rethinking how to handle dissonance and I'm fascinated with parallel harmony as well and trying to find ways to offset the effect of parallelism. Um, but for example, one effect that I find um, very attractive is um, to evoke the sound of um, consecutive 6-3 chords, first inversion chords, which of course is part of the um, faux bourdon style used both in England first and then on the continent. But instead of using first inversion chords to use the more unstable sound of 6-4 chords. And so the urge to resolve is all the stronger and this yes. creates a really dynamic sound, but of course, because the chord is so unstable, then you have to find ways to mitigate the effects of that. But while we're on the topic of um, Robert Carver, um, I would like to just take the opportunity to pay tribute to my teacher, Isabel Priest, Dr. Isabel Priest, who died in 1997, but she, effectively taught me everything that I know about counterpoint. And um, she wrote the book on Carver. And so <laughs> it inspired me to go to the library and to go and get um, Isabel's book and to read that and to find out more because I wasn't aware that he had used the long arm melody and she'll probably come and haunt me now for not knowing that, you know. <laughs> but, um, she was a great champion of um, Scottish music yeah. um, and she of course was a lecturer here in Newcastle when I was an undergraduate and I owe her an absolutely enormous debt and um, I'm just so glad that you gave me the opportunity to to acknowledge her in this way. Excellent. All right so um, again... I just wanted to pick up on um, um you're talking about second inversion chords because it just yeah. sounds so naughty <laughs> to have a string of second inversion chords and I love that. Um, uh, you know the, the the whole idea of sort of breaking the rules um when really it's it's not a particularly dissonant or violent or aggressive or or or, or terrible sound at all but it just it's you know when we're growing up we're taught how evil and how naughty it is to have a second inversion chord and i think subverting that and creating a piece of music that has a string of them is a, is a lovely lovely idea a lovely effect and why not it's yeah brilliant yeah i mean i think it's I mean, it's all about your aesthetic. And um, I think with aesthetics, the key thing is consistency. So sure. if you are going to say use consecutive fifths, for example, or yep. six, four chords as part of that, then you have to find some way of making it work as a consistent aesthetic so that it doesn't sound like a mistake. So what I say to my students is that, um, there isn't anything intrinsically terrible about parallel fifths, but if you're writing in the context, say, of a chorale harmonization where the parts are generally moving independently, then the sound of the parallel fifths will suddenly stand out. And it's rather like you were making a painting in watercolors, but then one part of that painting you did, say, in um, day glow um, acrylic paints, and it would just look wrong. It was <laughs> No, you're right. You're absolutely right. I I, I liked your point um, about making it um, um, make sense and you know, to 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 use parallel fifths. Oh, I think the thing is, it's being conscious, isn't it? It's being conscious of what you're doing um, and using them knowingly. And, 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 and yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So, I mean, there are many ways to show compositional skill, and. Um, as I say, finding a consistent approach to the naughty things is one of them. Okay, <laughs> but um, back on the topic of um, ostinati, um, these are really big part of your prize-winning composition. Composition. Let's get those words mixed up. Composition. Um, here are ye kings, yeah. and um, there's one bit where you have a, a short motif which is overlaid with these ostinati. That's one aspect of it. But the other thing that I find really appealing about this composition is your use of open fifths and octaves and really spare, resonant, clean harmony. Because, of course, in much contemporary con choral music, the tendency is just to bung in as many added yeah. notes to the chords yeah. as possible. But this is showing another way of thinking 
towards clarity and the beauty of the open sound. So could you tell me more about that, please? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, again, it's interesting. The more we talk about this, the more I become um, aware of, of how much I think about the performing space and the ensemble for which I'm writing. So exactly the same, in exactly the same way as I was thinking very much about the, the performing space and the choirs I was writing for in Lux A Turner. Again, um, writing for this, um, for Hereford Cathedral um, and knowing I was writing an introit, um, for to be sung in the cathedral um, and knowing also I was writing something that would need to be learned in a very short space of time I think all of those factors had an influence on the idea again of using repetition um, of having you know, of, of, of having a minimal ideas um, not not overloading the, 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 the performer or the listener with new concepts new ideas the whole time but I think particularly and it's it really helpful if an introit just has one sort of focal point really um and you know it doesn't sort of it's it's a miniature after all um and doesn't sort of bomb bombard you with with too much um and then you know writing for a piece that's going to be sung in a cathedral in, in that kind of resonant acoustic i just find that you don't need layer upon layer of, of chord to have a, have, a, have an effect in fact for me it's more about how many how few notes can I use to create a chord than, than, and still have the overriding contemporary sound that I'm looking for? Um, how many can I take away and still have that chord? And it's yes. amazing how many you can take away. Still, you can, you can end up with just two notes and, and it doesn't sound as if there's anything missing. Um, and it's all part of the sort of harmonic progression, I think. So, it, mm. you know, you're not necessarily only going to have two notes all, all the way through the piece, but you can vary between two and three occasionally four and but and, and then down to a unison or, or octaves um as you go through each phrase and and the effect is still dramatic still arresting still and i, I feel like it it's my voice you, you hear my voice in 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 that so yeah that's 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 where i was coming from with that one yeah i mean absolutely because um it's actually really hard to write a, a good short piece of music because, um, I mean, well, on the one level, to write a short piece of music is easy, but to write a good short piece of music is extremely difficult because you have to find something worth saying. Right. And you have to say it very clearly. Yes. And also, I love this idea of taking away the notes because, again, I think it shows great skill as a composer if you're able to say the most with the least. Yeah. And there's so much tendency these days to waste, to maximalism. But I find minimalism, the, the, the aesthetic, the idea of making the, the most of little, that I think shows the greatest merit. And um, I think that's just why that piece is so impactful. And I hope that um, it becomes really, really popular. So, <laughs> I really do. Um, it was, I mean, imagine winning. I, mean, I just, I was so, so thrilled. Um, and it was done completely blind. So no one knew who had entered. It was, it was one of those, um, you know, very much a, a level playing field. Anyone from any age, from any country, anyone at all could enter. Um, and no one, knew, I mean, I, it, was almost, it was almost impossible to find out who the, the five shortlisted composers were. I, mean, I, I managed to go to the premiere and I managed to chat to some of the people behind the scenes, but it was, it was one of those um, very much you know, anonymous entries. So yeah, it was a real, real, so that I, I, I feel very much um, that the piece won on merit. It's a really lovely Definitely. feeling to have. Yeah, and, and you know, really very, um, um, renowned judges as well, sort of added to the, the excitement of the whole experience. And of course, the Three Choirs Festival. I mean, that's the sort of pinnacle of, of summer summer choral festivals. So just, yeah, it was a great, great yeah, you know, well, highlight. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, one issue is, I mean, I think the highest accomplishment that a composer can achieve now is to develop an instantly recognisable voice. So, yeah. Um, that brings me on to my next question, actually. So before I tell you my opinion, I'd like to know your opinion. Who among living or recently departed composers do you admire the most? Who is your big inspiration? It, that's such a difficult question to answer. And I thought you might bring this up. So I've been pondering this a little. Um, and 
I've sort of come to the conclusion that I feel as though I have a lot of pieces that I admire greatly, but it's hard to, I don't have one particular composer and I know a lot of people do. So I, 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 I've, people have sort of championed their one composer, but I just don't quite feel like that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of Judith Weir. I think she's, fa I, I love her whole approach um, as well as her comp compositions themselves. Um, she's a real inspiration for me. Um, equally, I, I am a massive admirer of Cecilia McDowell and her amazing career trajectory. And she's an inspiration for me. Um, and some of the new generation of composers who are coming along um, at, at the moment, I'm fascinated to hear what they come up with because they don't have big um, oeuvres at the moment. But yeah, each time something new comes out, some, something new has been commissioned or, or, or they win a competition. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing. So, you know, Alison Willis, um, who is sort of emerging, I think, at the moment and, and finding herself um, having the opportunity you you I, I love I'm very much enjoying singing um some of your wonderful pieces with my um school choir uh which is you know and it's always really exciting when people that you kind of get to know produce something new you think oh yeah can I hear can, would I know it was them if I didn't know that, that, that if I didn't hadn't, hadn't seen that they'd written this piece um and I feel for, for myself um that's something that's I'm still developing that 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 personal voice and, and I think you know, as I compose, so there are aspects of me that I think you start to see time and time again. And, and you know, that's interesting, isn't it? Some composers have these really distinctive voices, Herbert Howells, Gerald mm. Finzi, they have these these particular, um, uh, Harris, you, you know, the, the, I'm talking about choral composers, that tends to be the area in which I'm working at the moment. But you hear these little um, motifs, um, little chord progressions that they use time and time again. And um, so you notice um, their, 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 their particular style. Not everyone does that, actually. So sometimes it, it, it's difficult to, to pinpoint what it is about a composer that makes their music recognisable. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can, of course you can, but it, it, you, you, it would be an analytical job. You would either say it's that particular chord progression or that particular modality that they like, that they like to rote in, you know, like maybe the, the sharpened fourth um, that you see, for example, in, in my Luxe Eterno and, and a few other pieces as well. I think I had a sort of phase of really enjoying that modality. Um, but yeah, what, what I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say about that, though. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you mentioned Herbert Howells. I mean, I would very much like to find a good um, discussion of his style because there, there was a book published recently. I won't um, say by whom because um, I thought it was a very good book, but um, I did feel that it was a bit sort of um, about Herbert Howells for chap. And yeah. I'm not, I was thinking is, I mean, a lot of musicology these days is focusing on that context and um, cultural criticism. And the thing is, I'm not in the slightest bit interested in that really. What really floats my boat is getting into the, into the nuts and bolts of the music itself. Yeah. And so it makes me a bit unfashionable, um, perhaps, but I want to know what it is that makes Howells's music sound like Howells and I have still yet to see a really good analytical discussion of his style um so who knows maybe that could be a job for me one day but as far as people that I admire I enormously respect um Arvo Part um because I think he has accomplished something of um inestimable magnitude, which is to create a distinctive style in a diatonic idiom. Yes, yeah, true. Um, so the Tintinabuli style, I think, is just a monumental achievement to come up with a way of using the seven diatonic notes and a way of organizing harmony To do that in a way that sounds completely individual and recognizable in such an economical way and so fresh and so contemporary I, I think that's just absolutely astonishing and I think it's quite all right incidentally if a composer uses the same few ideas over and over because if you get into analyzing um, J.S. Bach's compositions for example you will find that he gets an incredible amount of mileage out of the same three or four motivic figures, but none of the pieces ever really sounds the same. Yeah. 
So I think sometimes we're tempted just to try too hard. And it's often when we're not trying too hard that we truly find ourselves. And again, it's, it's not the ability to generate dozens and dozens of ideas within the piece that is the mark of a good composition in my view, it's rather the ability to get maximum variety and freshness out of just a few ideas. So, um, let me see how we're doing for time because I'm on the um, super duper cheapy, cheapy version of Zoom that um, limits the length of recordings. So, um, I think we're good for a moment yet, but we'll have to kind of change reels. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes you have to have the intermission while they're cheap. You know, God, I'm showing my age here. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really good analogy, actually. <laughs> All right, but um, that um, sort of moves me on to the question of why compose? What is your motivation for, for writing music? Yeah, really interesting one. Um, I was thinking about um, where this came from. Um, and th the truth is, I've always had music in my head, even from a very, very young age. It's been there. Um, what a curious thing. I, I, I wonder how many other people, um, as soon as they sort of have, have memories or ha are, are, are sort of able to, to realise what this is, have music there. Um, now, it's not always been written down, but it's always been sort of in there. Um, and from, from a relatively young age, I mean, I was lucky to, um, to, to have um, free music lessons as part of um, what the local authority provided. I was I lived in a London bar of Hounslow um, and the London bar of Hounslow in, in London, obviously London, yes, I said London, <laughs> um, they um, have these, they had in those days, um, this free Saturday morning provision where you could go along and have music lessons. Um, and I remember having the opportunity when I was very young, I think just maybe nine or 10, um, to compose as part of the, the provision there. There was, a, there was a, some composition and um, I wrote and had performed music at that stage. And I think that that we were clearly encouraged to do that at a young age meant that it was always seen as a normal extension yeah. of, of, of playing um, instruments, of learning instruments, the idea that composing is also you, know, you learn an instrument, you also write music as well. You know? um, so I, I used to jot little ideas down um, at, at the piano or, or uh, and, and just then once I um, carried on with music at school, GCSE and A-level music, composing is part of that. Um, and then I went on to read music at university and um, made composing my focus uh, at university and I've never really stopped. So that, that that's a sort of yeah I've always felt able to compose wanted to write things down um I don't know whether that's how all composers are or whether that's I don't know I'd be really interested to hear where your composing comes from um well I remember the was in the local church choir mm -hmm. and we're just getting to be um 10 minutes left so I'll find a convenient place to break this up in a moment but I'll just um respond to that and say that um I was in my local church choir um only for a short time and I don't really remember it very well but what I do remember um is first of all was just instilled a love of choral music in me I remember preparing for Christmas you know maybe 30 uh, well, 40 years ago to be honest and um I remember the thrill of singing um, harmonized Christmas carols for the first time and I remember especially when we had a brass band come and join us and I remember singing shiny instruments and being fascinated by that but the other thing that really struck, stuck in my mind is that um my mum and dad had um, a book of Beatles songs and um I was fascinated by the notation in it and so what I did was I kind of copied down and cobbled together some of the notation as best I could um, and then I wrote my own little piece of music and I took it to the organist and he very kindly played it through and it was so thrilling because I was like nine years old or so and I'd had no real musical training or anything like that so I thought oh something I've written with my own hands and he's playing it on the organ you know that was just just such an amazing feeling um but I mean I'd say that I'm 
you know, I've sort of taken many kind of um, um, sort of um, diversions and and sort of come to composing quite late in my life. And I mean, the thing is, I was new as I would be a composer, but I sort of came to it by a very roundabout route. So um, as an undergraduate, um, I started again to compose. I'd also been composing as a teenager, but um, I think that um, getting people to pay attention to your music is, is, is quite hard and um, getting good good feedback where you can build on it that's also a difficult thing um, but I remember I had the chance to write for a string quartet as an undergraduate and um, I wrote a piece that kind of prefigures what I do now really so I, I took an isorhythmic pattern and then subjected that to diminution um, but also used a lot of uh, repetition inspired by minimalism and there was a, an underlying pedal note, a dominant, and then this gave way to the tonic at the critical moment when the parts reached their fastest note values. And so there's a sense of release and excitement. And I remember, wow, that worked. Um, but then I sort of got knocked off course and I did this PhD. But in the process of doing my PhD, I learned a lot about compositional technique because I was studying the music of a really great composer, Heinrich Schütz, and um, that taught me a lot, which I stored away in my mind. Then I started composing again a bit later than that, but then got diverted by other things. And then about five or six years ago, um, something happened to me that um, made me really realize where my true vocation and desire lay. And so I decided to focus exclusively on composition seriously and i think it's when you really get serious about things that's when things start to happen so i went back to school effectively so i remember that um i studied all of the beginners books all over again you know and um i would get up at five in the morning to have my composition lesson with jess back i did the gig what what is she saying there well the thing is i believe in a way you can have you can learn from previous figures because um, you can take their music and then you can interrogate it. And then you can imagine that the composer himself or herself is standing in front of you. And with a bit of imagination, you can interrogate the music and by extension interrogate them and receive a kind of composition lesson. And so again, I would, say to Bach when I was studying yeah. one of his preludes or one of his views, well, what is it that you're teaching me through this? What is it that I can learn from this composition? And I would copy it out and focus on those questions. Again, when I imagined Josquin de Pré standing in front of me, then I could imagine him saying, first of all, you need to really, really get to know your material. That means you need to look at it in inversion, retrograde, retrograde inversion. You need to study the canonic possibilities. You need to study what it would be like in different mensurations. And it's imagining what you would be taught if you could be taught by these people is almost as good as actually being taught by them. But yeah, so just before I sort of change reels, as it were, um, I'll say that um, I think it's it's when you get serious, that's, that's when you get serious results. Okay, so we were just talking about, um, about inspirations for compositions and about, um, I suppose, about the process of learning. So I was just um, speaking about my um, maybe slightly eccentric way of um, imagining that I have some dead composers standing in front of me um, well I, I, I thought it's a really interesting perspective um i think it's something that i'm going to take forward when i in my teaching what can what what is this composer teaching what are you learning from this composer i think it's a really good question to ask i mean i i, I teach a level music um and my students of course learn um to write bark chorales and i think 
when we're looking at some of Bach's chorales, I think that's a question we need to ask. You know, what is Bach teaching us here? And I've never really, I've never really framed it in that particular pers uh, context. So I think that would be a really, a really, I think it's a really interesting angle to take. And I, I think, thank you for that. I think it's a, that's yeah. all right. Well, it's not entirely original. I mean, um, I got it actually from a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And he actually goes into slightly worrying and bizarre manifestations of this because um, I think towards the end of his life, he literally thought that he was talking to, um, but the idea of imagining that you're talking to um, people from the past that you'd like to learn from, I think that is fruitful and proper, but unfortunately it seems like Hill might have gone a little bit um, too far along that road, shall we say. Um, but Nevertheless, it's all about imagination, you know, and I think also having some sense of, of a human connection, because all too often, if you look at a Bach chorale, it can seem from a pedagogical point of view as being something rather dry and rule driven. But if you see it as a as where the rules are there to help you express yourself and to write in your most efficient and best voice then I think that can be transformative, which takes us neatly onto another topic, which is all about teaching composition. So um, tell me about your experience of teaching, please. Oh, I, I feel that I am in the most amazingly privileged position um, as a secondary school teacher. Uh, and I just, I revel in the opportunity to, to just, first of all, to, to, let the students know that everyone is a composer. And there, there are no limits. You all have music in you in some way. And even if you don't, we can we can find ways to help you express yourself. So really, you know, from the from the youngest age, I think that it's something that could, should be an integral part of music making. I firmly believe that, and I just I just don't think there are any limits really um, in in the opportunity to 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 express yourself musically and I think part of that is composing um, but certainly as we go up through the through the key stages um, at GCSE and A level there is a requirement of course the, um, the, the specification requires the children to hand in um, compositions of certain lengths that have to fulfill certain mark schemes it's a um, uh, nature of the beast so I love the idea well actually it's really interesting because it very much leads on what we were just saying um I I have I have a way in which I teach which involves looking at the works of other composers and using them as scaffolding oh. so I really like to look um with the students at um oh, for example a uh, a, a, a piano piece by Robert Schumann that has been conceived as a sort of eight bar melody, something, you know, really straightforward to start with. And we look, we, we sort of analyze that. Gosh, it's, I just I just realized it's exactly what we were saying earlier. Um, we analyze that on a bar by bar basis, melodic melody first and then harmony. And then I ask the students to do exactly the same thing. So, you know, if, if, if um, if Robert Schumann writes um, a two bar phrase, which he then directly repeats, I want them to do the same construct your two bar phrase, direct, directly repeat it. And then if he then um, starts the phrase the same, but it extends it for another four bars, then I ask them to do the same. And then they have their own eight bar melody. Uh, and then the next thing we do, is a come up uh, we have a look at what harmony he uses to harmonize and of course it's the primary triads first and foremost so it's just i just think it's a really great way of getting into composing and then once we've done that a few times um, my next step is i say to them well what's your what's a, your favorite piece that you're playing at the moment what do you really enjoy playing or what you what are you really enjoying singing let's look at that piece and let's see if that piece can inspire you and and the thing i find absolutely fascinating about this particular method is that soon very soon the students stop sounding like the person they're they're um they're, they're using as their teacher um and they move very much away and you wouldn't know where 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 they the, the origins of their piece you really you, know, you could ask anyone they wouldn't be able to say oh that's based on a piece by robert schumann you just wouldn't know uh, because the 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 um the, the the musical language is is so different and of course they have other influences that they bring in mostly entirely subconsciously but it just seems to me to be a really great way of getting students composing so that's that's how i do it 
That's great. And also, um, there is actually a very well-known composer, but in the um, popular genre, who uses exactly that technique to write his own hit records, and that's Paul Simon. So <laughs> you take a pre-existing song, and then you change it chord by chord, note by note, until gradually he had something that was utterly different from the starting point. And also, this idea of writing parody uh, um, is very old anyway. So mm -hmm. going back to the early 16th century, we have the beginning of the parody mass, yeah. and it became often a way of paying tribute to another composer um, to take a famous motet, and then yeah. to see how you could use it in ingenious ways to express both your admiration for that composer, but also to express yourself. Um, and, and what's interesting, of course, is that um, it, this, it, this gets you away from ever having the blank manuscript paper moment, which a lot mm. of children struggle with. Um, and of course, the, 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 the way schools are structured is I see these children for an, one hour a week. Um, so they just they see me um, and I have several several children in, in each class, of course, so they, they arrive, we have an hour and then off they merrily go. Um, and then the next week they, they, they turn up and have an hour and I do say, you're very welcome to continue composing between the lessons. <laughs> More often than not, it doesn't necessarily happen. Um, and I think that sometimes that, you know, composing in those short bursts, it can be quite stressful to have a blank sheet of paper or not to know what to do next. But with this method, you never not know what to do next, because, of course, my mantra is, well, what did she do next? Yeah, look at the person who who you're who who, who you are emulating, and, and ask yourself, you know, what did she do in her middle section? What did she do in her in her develop in her in her development section? How, what was her coda like, or his coda? You know, to ha have a look at the the, the the composer on which you are are basing your works. Or sometimes, of course, if you think, well, I don't like what they did with their coda, well get another piece out that you're learning um, um, and what do they do with their coder so there are you know i think that when you have that that sense of emulation um it, it's our it's our dead teacher isn't it our dead teacher is omnipresent exactly and of course um one of the <laughs> advantages of um using this kind of imaginary teaching is of course you avoid all of the um, possible negative things that could happen in real life. So, um, you know, by imagining that Jess Spark is teaching me, at least I don't have to suffer the big man, you know, clopping me around the head when I make a mistake, for example. <laughs> um, so, um, I don't know if you've ever tried this, but um, one of the things that, um, one of the things that I would do, especially when I was first getting really serious about composition, is that um, I would um, set myself a task um, and I'd say, right, you've got 30 minutes and you're going to compose a minuet, come on, May, and what's more, you're not allowed to use the piano or anything like that, you have to do it entirely mentally. Um, and oh, I got no end of stick from my family about this, but what I would do is... Um, before dinner we would have <laughs> we would have a pre-dinner cocktail and i remember being on local radio talking about this and um saying oh you know i would have a pre-dinner cocktail and then i would write a piece of music <laughs> while doing this and then my my parents heard this and they thought this was hysterically funny um and so i get teased to this day about pre-dinner <laughs> cocktails <laughs> but nevertheless what's wrong with a pre-dinner cocktail i mean <laughs> you know, while, while drinking my martini before <laughs> having dinner i would compose a minuet and Very i think the discipline of this extremely helpful so do you have any um practice um similar to this as a way of 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 um, kind of stretching and challenging yourself? Suddenly enough, no. <laughs> I know. Um, it, I suppose it, it, it rather brings me on to the subject of when we find time to compose. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, sadly, I am not a full-time composer, much as I would love to be mm -hmm. um, at the moment. Uh, you know, we'll see what the future holds. But um, no, I'm a full-time music teacher. Um, in a busy secondary school. So uh, that takes up a lot of my time. And when I'm not doing that, I am a full-time parent and uh, wife. So <laughs> what with all of those tasks? There's not a lot of time for pre-dinner minuets, sadly. But no, in, 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 in all seriousness, um, 
Uh, what, what a privilege to be someone who can dedicate their life to composing without any other distractions. Um, I, there are a few, I think, um, in, in who are alive today. Um, and certainly um, in, in, in some of the systems that we had in the past, where um, you'd had have a, have a, have a, a patron or benefactor, um, that, you know, there, there, there were ways that that, that helped, but I, I, I'm, I have to earn a living. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. I know. So yeah, sadly, um, I just don't have the have, have enough opportunity for that. But what a lovely idea! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as I say, I mean, I suppose making a lot out of a little. Um, so um, I, um, I'm, I don't drink very much, and I'm very, very frugal in my lifestyle because I think it's about identifying what's really, really important to you, and. Um, for me, um, composition is simply the most important thing, and I'm I'm willing to make sacrifices to make that happen. And I'd rather compose and have a lower income than than do other things and have a higher income. But of course, you know, like you, I also have to have to earn a living. But I feel very blessed, in fact, because as a as, as a lecturer, um, and I'm only a part time lecturer, but find being able to help other people to discover music and to learn and to grow that I think is riches in itself I agree um, yeah hugely um, it, it, it hugely enriches our lives and it's a great privilege to be able to do that yeah. and I mean as I, as I was saying I mean earlier on I was paying tribute to one of my lecturers from nearly 30 years ago and you know, well, you know, I only knew her for, for, for a short time, but she made a really deep and lasting impact in my life. So if I could pay that forward in some way, and perhaps in 30 years time, maybe somebody was saying, oh, you know, we had this eccentric lecturer and her name was Tamsin Jones and, you know, um, but, you know, she instilled a love of Franco-Flemish polyphony in me, then, or... You know, she got me composing. I never thought I could do it before I got up to university. People said that I couldn't, you know, or they said to me, oh, your composing's not for girls. But then Tamsin showed me that, yes, you can. And if, if, if that could be part of my legacy, <laughs> then that would be just something that, that would make me really, really proud in this moment. Um, so, um. We've covered quite a, a lot of topics, but um, I'd like to just go back for a moment to this um, idea of taking other people's music, because of course you've made many arrangements, mm -hmm. many beautiful arrangements of um, other composers' music. Um, so I'd like us to talk a little bit about those, please. And um, to start off with, um, there are two pieces that really stand out for me, and they are your arrangement of um, Poston's Dormas Carol, and also Clara Schumann's um, wonderful Ave Maria. So please tell me more about those. Yes, I'd love to. Um, I'll start with the Clara Schumann, actually. So the Clara Schumann's part of a um, little project I devised for myself where I found that I have an upper voices choir um, at school and I wanted them to sing the widest possible um, variety of music from the greatest number of composers and from every era they know I want that too <laughs> they're aware and I I was just finding that although there are plenty of contemporary female composers who we sing as part of you know the the um our program um they just the, there just wasn't the upper voices repertoire by some of the wonderful historical women um, and Clara Schumann, case in point, she had written this song for Mixed Choir and, and several songs for Mixed Choir, actually, which is great. Um, but I don't have a Mixed Choir. So my solution to that was to take um, a piece for um, for SATV and to um, reimagine it for um, upper voices and piano accompaniment. 
Um, and that's where Ave Maria comes from. And, and not only that, um, her original song, um, she said secular words, but for my purposes, if I wrote an Ave Maria, it would mean that then my choir would be able to sing this in um, in a sacred context and then potentially other choirs too. Um, and it is indeed the case. It's really useful to have um, these sorts of pieces to, to be sung by upper voices choirs um, in church services, perhaps you know, during the administration of communion um, and at various other points in the service as well, depending, depending on what sort of um, service it is. Um, so that was the catalyst for that. Um, and I wrote it ostensibly for my choir. They sang it um, on several occasions. Um, and it's now since been published by um, Banks Music Publications. And I've heard of several several upper voices choirs saying, oh, yeah, but that's brilliantly it just fits into fit, fits into our programming perfectly. It's great because it means the children um, or the women get a chance to sing um, something by Clara Schumann. So that's that's where that came from. And then the Elizabeth Poston, um, the Dormouse. Again, so many choirs sing Jesus Christ the Apple Tree at Christmas. Mm. Um, and it's, lo it's lovely and it's really mm -hmm. interesting piece. And she, she's well known um, um, through that piece in particular. But um, I knew of the Dormouse's Carol um, as um, a unison piece. But I wanted my choir to have the opportunity to sing something in harmony and it, the piece lends itself to a second line so well. I mean, I just, as soon as I started to, to, to think about how, how, how it might be, it's just, gosh, there is a, there's a second line hidden here without me trying very hard. I just, yeah, I was just able to extract it without, without that much trouble at all. Um, and suddenly it meant that I could have characterization and I don't know whether you're particularly aware but it's one of the things I'm quite into the I, I look at the lyrics of pieces and I really love the idea um, of characterizing um the, the the various people within who are inherent within the lyrics so you know when I um and my um Gabriel's message you have a, a soloist who is Mary a soloist who is Gabriel and there are various other pieces as well that I've, I've done that and, and it's the same in, in the Dormouse's Carol we have we have the Dormouse's voice and we have the lizard <laughs> and um and it's, it's just the most delightful piece it's all about um the Dormouse is of course hibernating because it's it's winter and the lizard wakes the Dormouse up because Jesus is being born and he can't he can't hold back his excitement and he wants to tell the dormouse, you must come and have a look at this exciting event. Come with me. And they go running down the hill together and they see this miraculous um, birth. So <laughs> it was just, yeah. And then the, 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 my choir sang it last Christmas um, and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> mm. And yeah, I love that imaginative approach to the arrangement. And um, I get the feeling that you would be absolutely in your element if you were to compose an opera. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, it's funny. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I wasn't going to to say. Um. But this piece. I mean, it just sounds ridiculous thinking about it now. But the piece I was talking about right at the beginning of our conversation. Um. That I was encouraged to write when I was just nine or ten. Um. It was of that style, operatic in style. It was for soloists and chorus and um instrumental accompaniment, and it was performed um in in the um in a in a sort of operatic um, circumstance. So I was incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to do that. And just amazingly inspirational teachers that just let me run with it. Um, but yes, large scale um, would be tremendously exciting. I just, you know how it is with opera. Um, and I think Berlioz had a, a similar problem in France. Um, no, one would, no one would take him on <laughs> because opera is so expensive. Um, and I think that's sort of where programmatic music sort of evolved from because for Berlioz, it was just his sort of solution to not actually being able to have funding for opera, but he was able to write um, music which had this sort of inherent story. And, and it's just like, well, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever be um, commissioned to write an opera. I can't imagine that. Okay. Well, if there's anyone out there, I mean, hit me up. Um, <laughs> but I can, of course, <laughs> I can, I can have that sort of, um, that characterization in, 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 in the arrangements I make and in some of the compositions that I write. So, yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, you never know. And um, these last few years, I mean, we've just been on a, a rocket-like trajectory and longer may that continue. Thank you. Um, so um, this takes me back a little bit and um, I wondered if you can sort of give me your thoughts about what do you think makes a good 
piece of music? What do you look for? What appeals to you? What, what says makes... to you this is a really good and well-written composition? Yeah, I think, I think you need to feel something. Um, and I do a fair amount of adjudication. Uh, I have the opportunity to listen to perform performers. It's interesting being an adjudicator because you're, you're sort of having to interpret somebody else's rules and somebody else's um, um, criteria and categories. But I often get invited to do that in, in various schools and organisations. And for me, it, it all boils down to the emotional response, whether I moved. And it's the same with, with music, um, with, with compositions. I, I, I think that the music has to touch you in some way. Um, and it's, I find it particularly interesting listening to record review um, and building a library on, on Radio 3. And it seems to be the same. It's that you know, they, they, they tend to choose pieces or, or, or tend to choose interpretations of pieces that that have a, some kind of emotional connection with the, the, the listener. And of course, it, it, that, that differs from person to person. I mean, I, I have some I'm very fond of of particular pieces or particular um, uh, interpretations, uh, which I find very moving. And I've heard people say they don't particularly enjoy those recordings or those versions. Um, and I think it's the same with the compositions themselves. There's you know, music that, that you and I might really enjoy that another person might find incomprehensible uh, or just meaningless. So it's it's quite a personal thing, isn't it? But yeah, I think it has, I think the emotional connection is really, key to, to 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 a good piece of music yeah i mean i find myself inclined to um agree with um schoenberg on this because um he wrote a book called style and idea and um one of the passages that really stuck with me is when he's talking about the duty of an artist to communicate an idea and at my first reading i thought well you know but the thing is you know i don't have that many ideas that I want to communicate and I don't have a big idea about society for example but then I realized that idea can be a multifaceted thing and can encompass such things as emotion or it can be something about yourself or it can be a philosophical idea or it could be a new way of looking at things in, in other words anything whatsoever can be a message but it's having some sort of message, something to say to other people. Yeah. And I find, well, um, I'm not actually a particularly emotionally driven person, I think, but I'm more, I suppose, interested in a kind of an abstract inner life and on the relationship between symbols and I suppose maybe that's because of the kind of mind that I have and I tend to think a lot about um, about abstract relationships and about patterns but that in itself can be a message that fascination that obsession with the abstract world the ideal symbolic world when fully concentrated and distilled and then expressed in music. And I think that's why I find composers such as um, Ok Gem and Joskan so fascinating because they seem to have been driven by the same sort of motivation, this obsession with getting the most out of the least possible material, of finding all of the possibilities, yes. of combining things. Um, Shelby too, of course, with his approach, interestingly. Yeah, it's so interesting what you say about pattern. Um, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, because the interesting thing about pattern is you can either you can either fulfill or deny expectation, can't you? Definitely. And, and then you can you can lead people in a particular direction, and then it's you're, you're very much in, in charge when you use pattern of of the direction in which the piece is going, and 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 the, the journey on which you are taking your your listener. Yeah, it's a really I think you're absolutely right there. Really interesting. And also, I mean, I find if you do have this kind of this this genuine urge to say something, then other people will take from that what they need to. 
So one person might perceive your composition as being peaceful and relaxing, other people might find it stirring. Yes. That doesn't matter, because yes. if you have a message and you have something to say, then you can't control how other people receive that message, but nevertheless, you are still building a bridge. Yes, um, absolutely. Yes, and I find that in my teaching, I ask the children, um, what 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 mood they think the music is evoking and they all have very different ideas sometimes it's really curious but you said there's no, there, there's no wrong answer there it's it's how it how it touches them individually yeah fascinating yeah and also i mean again it's it's possible by this way of thinking to escape from cliches about music because um i recently did a podcast with um arthur brewer which will be broadcast in um, december um on his melodology series and um, we were talking about um Heinrich Hiesack's melody Innsbruck muss dich lassen try saying that after a few martinis and um one of the things I find fascinating about this melody is that um it is extremely simple and it is in a major key and on paper it doesn't have any right to be expressive. You would look at it and think, well, that's a very simple major key melody. How can that possibly be moving? But I find it's one of the most poignant, most heart-rending compositions that I know of. And again, somehow music can transcend the values that we attach to it. But again, I think Isaac was expressing something of himself and it's the, the purity of that message and that intention that somehow is able to come through the centuries and still be interpretable by us whether we receive the same message is completely irrelevant it's just the fact yeah. there is a message and yeah. it somehow lies outside the cliches of music and <laughs> golly no, it's a really good point. Of course. Up late. <laughs> <laughs> no i know uh, and of course you know we hear music with 21st century ears so Definitely. Mm. it's just you can't make any <sighs> I think he hearing music written in the Renaissance book classical room and any any era um but hearing it with our contemporary ear we are going to be hearing music differently aren't we our, our, our contemporary musical experiences are, are such that our ears are going to listen in a different way to the ears that were listening 400 years ago, 500 years ago. So, yeah, I know we're That's in the hearing now. Else. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, whatever emotion or whatever intention the composer had, because he or she had that intention, that still manages to survive. Amazingly so. Yeah, Amazingly so. And some, I think, some, some, some emotions do seem to transcend time some uh, and some um just this I, I feel that we react the same way as people might have reacted in 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 centuries yeah. gone by to some some of the most powerful sentiments i'm just thinking maybe of some of the um St. matthew passion music and just i i feel that it's just as the, the impact it has on on listeners today would is going to have been similar to the impact it would have had to, to Bach's mm -hmm. contemporaries. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking back. Um, um, there is a piece called Die Sieben Worte am dem Kreuzer um, by Schutz, The Seven Last Words from the Cross. And that was my first, in well, one of my first encounters with Schutz's music. And I find for me, it, it again, it has that direct impact. And um, in a certain cathedral, they have a 15th century Flemish, um, they have a 15th century Flemish wood panel altar that contains a depiction of the passion scene. And whenever I hear the Schutz Sieben Water, I can imagine almost the figures in this panel coming alive and speaking to each other. And then when I look at the panel, I hear the music in my mind, but there's something tremendously vivid about my composition. And the do, do you think it's amazing that, um, that somebody might have been doing exactly the same thing as you 400 mm -hmm. years ago, also looking at the panel, thinking in the same way someone 
of a of, of a generation back back you know one of, perhaps one of your ancestors might even have done that that yeah. that, that very same thing how, how incredible for that to have been the case <laughs> Okay, so we're coming towards the end of our time together this morning, and um, I've got a couple more questions for um, my guest composer, Olivia, and um, first of all, this is a tough one, I warn you, but um, where do you think music is heading? Um, so what do you think the choral music of the future, what do you think it might be like? Oh, that's an interesting question, goodness. Well, it's it's interesting for me um, because much of my output is sacred vocal music, sacred choral music. Um, and there's a particular sort of aesthetic um, that I think is expected um, in, in a church context. Uh, and although I think you can push a little, um, it's, it's for a higher, higher, um, being isn't it you know for, mm. to the glory of god and i think that a, a lot of the time um as a composer one has an awareness of that and certainly those who are choosing to program or not program your music um are selecting it uh, for um for a service context and they're going to have that 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 sort of awareness of the the context in which it's going to be sung it's all about that for me um and that there's a certain um, type of music I think that is expected. Um, and I know that some um, cathedrals and churches have particular criteria of the sort of, sort of music that would be acceptable or appropriate to be sung. Um, and some have, have a different approach um, and might be, be differently minded about the sort of music that they might expect um, in a, in a, in a, liturgical context so I think there's always going to be that sense of of the higher purpose in mm. in, in in much of the music I write um but where music is going generally well I, I think it's been we've, we've lived through a very interesting time certainly when I was at university it was very uncool to write anything tonal Indeed. it was um you know it was, it was either frowned upon or laughed at um yes. and yeah there were several wonderfully famous and uh, um, successful composers who, were, who, who, who whose music um, I've sung in, in, in church contexts, um, who would really just weren't respected as serious composers. And I think by and large, that feeling has, has gone now. And this sort of, the, this sort of new embracing of uh, music within a tonal context is doesn't there doesn't seem to be any sort of um, a criticism from those on high of of that style of writing so I think that's a, a refreshing change I think it's refreshing certainly for the performers who had to struggle through terribly dissonant uh, challenging pieces certainly some of the stuff I wrote when I was at university I don't think would be um high on the list of uh, um, choir directors now. <laughs> yeah, um, I, mean, I, I, I had a, a very similar experience. So attending university in the 1990s, I mean, essentially it would be unthinkable to write in a, um, certainly to write in a, in a, in a modal way as I do, um, and to write tonally in general. But um, I think certainly towards the end of this century and, uh, sorry, towards the end of last century and then going through into this century, I think, I think it's a realization that there's still, as Schoenberg himself said, there's still a great deal of good music that can be written in C major, and there's still new possibilities if only you look for them. So Arvo, Arvo Part, shows that you can write in a diatonic style and still achieve a highly distinct and original voice. And James um, McMillan as well, I think, has a similar aesthetic. Um, uh, you know, uh, he's although there there are some dissonant um pieces by him he, it's, it's within that sort of tonal context i think he's well, a it's good interesting example. yeah yes yeah, interesting you should talk about macmillan because i feel that he himself has changed direction because a lot of earlier music was very challenging and now yes. he is adopting this kind of new tonality um often with very interesting results um but i think alongside part i think the other person that i admire greatly is eric whitaker um, 
And I think a large part of it is because he finds a way to really push the boundaries of the added note style. So it's one thing just to um, stick in the odd fourth or the odd um, ninth and to say, ah, oh, voila, 21st century harmony. You know, nothing wrong with that and it works very well. But I think Whitaker really takes this to a much greater extreme while still maintaining a tonal integrity yeah. and, and easy appeal. And I think yeah. it's that ability to remain accessible while pushing the boundaries. I think that is what really gives Whitaker um, the edge as far as that is concerned. Um, so I look up to him a great deal. Um, yeah. Yep. So um, yeah. just to finish off with, um, I believe that you have recently written a book and that that is very soon to be published. So I wondered if you might um, tell me about that, please. I'd love to. Yes. Uh, so I um, I'm fascinated by um, the changing voice um, in children. Um, boy, how ha how children's voices uh, change and develop um, through their lives from from youngsters all the way through um, to late teens into the early 20s and how important it is as teachers that we are really aware of what's going on and support them well particularly through the teenage years but earlier too um, and I've done a lot of reading and research on this and fascinating area uh, um, and I feel that the children themselves would really value from knowing a little bit more about their voices and how their voices work and having all their questions answered and even having questions they didn't know to ask answered so I've written a book and my book is called uh, A Young Person's Guide to Vocal Health and it really is um, all-encompassing and it's aimed at um, children from about the age of eight up, so sort of choristers up, um, and it's, 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 it's relevant and suitable, although it's written in a very accessible style, um, for children um, all the way up into their teenage years, and you know, even those going off to music college, who will still have many questions that they need answered about their changing voices, how their voices are developing, and you know, if something goes wrong, what to do about it, and how to prevent it going wrong again. So this is, my publisher tells me, at the printers. So yes, it's exciting. I'm very excited. It's published by Compton um, Publishing, who are specialists in this area. Um, it really should be out very soon indeed. And I shall be flooding social media <laughs> with my congratulations. I look forward to seeing this. So, yeah, well, I'm very excited. It's been it's been a long time um in 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 the little in the process between writing it and having it published. I've been sort of waiting on on, on various um uh, um drafts but yeah it's actually at the printers so it should be out very soon um and i'm I imagine available from all good bookshops or directly from compton publishing themselves but yeah thank you for asking about that really excited about it coming out i'm excited too so i shall i shall definitely look out for that so well that brings us to the end of our of our conversation and i'd just like to thank you very much for um, sparing um, a couple of hours with me this morning um i thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you and um i really enjoy your music and um i really look forward to watching you progressing and um i yeah well thank you very much indeed and um i hope that um, we'll be able to speak again very soon and um so good luck with everything and thank you Thank you very much. Um, likewise, it's been brilliant speaking to you. I'm a huge admirer of your compositions and my choir <laughs> are actually singing some of your works at the moment. So it's, it's lovely to have this chat. Thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you.